Here we are in John chapter 10, beginning now at verse 22. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Here we have a transition from previously where Jesus was in Jerusalem and up on the Temple Mount. He was discussing with the religious leaders about how poorly they had treated a fellow Jewish person, this man who was born blind, and how Jesus made a contrast between them being unrighteous and unworthy shepherds over God's people and how Jesus himself is the good shepherd full of love and care for God's people. Well, that was a very strong contrast that he pointed out last week. Now, in the section following, Jesus is going to continue this controversy with the religious leaders. And I want you to notice how it begins. It begins with Jesus just walking on the Temple Mount. If you take a look at verse 22, it doesn't say that Jesus is teaching. He's not drawing a crowd. He's just making his place from one place on the Temple Mount to another. But maybe he was on his way to teach. Maybe he had just finished teaching somewhere, but he's not doing it at the time. He's just walking. We also see that it was the Feast of Dedication, which today we call Hanukkah. It was that very same feast where Jesus was there in Jerusalem during this time. So it's winter time. The implication behind the wording there where it says, and it was winter, is actually that it was stormy, perhaps even rainy. So Jesus is underneath the covering of an area on the temple called Solomon's Porch. It wasn't exposed directly to the air outside, but it provided some shelter from the rain and the wind. Jesus is walking along, and what happens next? Look with me now at verse 24, where we read, Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Friends, can you let the movie run in your mind just for a few moments? Here's Jesus, and I'm sure his disciples are somewhere nearby. They're kind of walking together down this area, Solomon's porch, Solomon's colonnade. There they are. And then it seems like out of nowhere, like ninjas, he's surrounded by all these religious leaders. And it's a very hostile kind of act. I mean, it's implied right there in verse 24 where you say, then the Jews surrounded him. By the way, we notice this familiar usage in the Gospel of John where John uses that phrase, the Jews, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, he's speaking of the religious leaders. He says the religious leaders, they surrounded Jesus with his hostile intent, and notice what they asked in verse 24, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. You might be saying, hasn't Jesus told them that he was the Christ? Well, let me put it to you, yes and no. The the yes answer that we're going to consider, the yes answer is much, much bigger. But I do need to tell you plainly that among the Jews, especially in Jerusalem, Jesus did not often, I'm not going to say never, but he did not often directly refer to himself as the Christ, the Messiah. Why? Well, for very good reason. It's not because he isn't the Messiah. Oh, no, he's the Messiah, as Jesus will explain in just a few moments. But you need to remember that that title, Messiah, or as it is in the Greek language, Christ, those two, that that title, Messiah, it was a very politically charged title and a very militarily charged. When you said Messiah to the Jews of that generation, they thought a military and political conqueror. And that's why Jesus said, listen, I am the Messiah, but I'm not the Messiah you've been looking for. You're looking for a Messiah who will call down fire on heaven upon the Roman legions. I'm not that Messiah. So in a sense, Jesus said that he would deliberately avoid frequently using that term. Instead, he used all this other terminology to refer himself as God the Son and Messiah to make it very plain. So that's why they're asking, and they're doing it very hostile intent. If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. But I want you to notice something else there in verse 24. Notice the phrasing. How long do you keep us in doubt? Who are they blaming for their doubt? They're blaming Jesus. It's as if they're saying, you know, Jesus, if only you made it more plain, then we would believe. There are many people with the same attitude today. They essentially blame God for their unbelief. You know, God, I would believe in you. You just haven't made it clear enough. 
I would believe in you, but you just haven't put enough evidence in creation. You haven't put enough evidence in your word. You haven't put enough evidence in history working through Jesus Christ. You haven't done a good enough job, God. Therefore, I doubt. Friends, can I give you a little tip? Here's the tip. Don't blame Jesus for your doubt. And you may have your doubts, and some of them may be legitimate. Some of them may not be, frankly. But I'll just say this. Don't blame Jesus for your doubts. God has given us plenty of evidence, reasonable evidence, rational evidence in Jesus Christ for us to be able to make a logical determination. This is the Messiah. This is God the Son. This is the person in whom I should put my trust. It's not, fault, it's not Jesus' fault if you or I don't believe. You know, it's a little bit like this. It's a little bit like a person who's driving down the road and they're speeding and the policeman pulls them over and the policeman, you know, says, hey, did you know you're speeding? And the person says, well, officer, I was speeding, I know. But you know what the problem is? You don't have enough speed limit signs up. You know, if you would put up a speed limit sign every 100 yards, oh, well, then for sure I would keep the speed limit. Friends, is that really the case? Is the fact that you and I speed, and yes, I'm speaking to you, Now I'm also speaking to myself. Is the fact that we drive faster than the speed limit, is it because we don't know what the speed limit is? Is it because there aren't enough speed limit signs out on the road? No, we know. We want to drive faster than the speed limit says. And this is so often the case with people who don't believe. It's not a matter of there not being enough signs. It's just they don't want to obey the signs that they've already been given. Now, on that point, notice here, next in verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Jesus is essentially answering them in two ways. The first thing he says is, guys, I told you. You want to know if I am the Christ, if I am the Messiah? I told you, verse 25, I told you, and you do not believe. Now, again, Jesus says, I know that I haven't been highlighting the title Messiah among you. By the way, I find it fascinating, a little bit of a side point, but I find it fascinating that among Gentiles and Samaritans, Jesus was much more quick to describe himself as the Messiah openly. Why? Because they didn't have the same political and military associations with the term. Because, listen, I've told you plainly. I've explained to you again and again who I am. And if you think about it, just taking the gospel of John, who has Jesus told them that he is? Jesus could say, I told you, I am the one who came from heaven. I told you that whoever believes on me would have eternal life. I told you that I am the unique son of God. I told you that I will judge all of humanity. I told you that everyone should honor me just as they honor God the Father. I told you that the Hebrew scriptures all speak of me. I told you that I perfectly reveal God the Father. I told you that I always please God and that I never sin. I told you that I am uniquely sent from God. I told you that before Abraham was, I am. I told you that I will raise myself from the dead. I told you that I'm the bread of life that I am the light of the world, that I am the door, and that I am the good shepherd. Haven't I told you enough? And friends, that's just how Jesus described himself up to this point in the Gospel of John, not to mention all the other Gospels and how he described himself. No, my friends, Jesus told them plenty, and he's just drawing it back to their attention that this is so. The problem wasn't that Jesus was unclear about who he was and where he came from. The problem was that the religious leaders had hearts of unbelief and they wanted to blame their unbelief upon Jesus. Jesus wasn't having it. But then if you look at verse 25 again, there's a second part to Jesus' answer. The second part is simply this. He says, listen, it's not only what I say, the words that I speak, I already told you, it's also Verse 25, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. If you look at my life and the works that I do, you will see that I am a man sent 
from God. Not only in the fact that Jesus did miraculous things, because friends, let's be honest, other people in the Bible did miraculous things, did they not? But they weren't the Messiah. They weren't God the Son. No, the difference was, was Jesus did miraculous things in exactly the way God the Father does things. He did everything at the prompting of God the Father and was completely consistent in that. So Jesus could say, look at my words and look at my works and you will see exactly who I am. And friends, that's an open invitation to the whole world from that point forward. Do you want to know who Jesus is? Look at his words and look at his works and you will see who Jesus is. But you know, it just got me thinking about that this week. Isn't that true for all of us? Isn't it true for you and for I? that people rightfully determine who we are based on what we say and what we do. I, I mean, I can just say this, that a man or a woman is known by his words and his deeds. Think about it. Now, you may say, no, 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 no. I am actually this wonderful person on the inside. It's just you'd never know it how I talk and by how I live. And listen, there could be some truth to that. Every one of us may not live up in what we say and what we do to the person that we are on the inside, but how can you expect anybody else to believe that? You see, you may be that really wonderful, beautiful person on the inside, it's just nobody can ever see it or hear it because the way that you talk and the way that you live seems to indicate that you're not such a wonderful person. Friends, this just hits home with us, doesn't it? If we, as followers of Jesus Christ, are going to, in a God-honoring way, represent our Savior, it has to come down to the way that we talk and the way that we live in this world. It also points to something else that I think is really worthy of our focus. It's really worthy of our mention. You see, there are some people, they live double lives. They have this whole secret area of their life. Now, I don't know if it's more common today than it used to be. In some ways, I think it is. I think that things like the smartphone and uh, and other technological things of our modern day make it easier for someone to represent themselves to the world on the internet or through social media or through whoever to have a secret life. But friends, if you've got a secret life, do you see that in a frightening way, your words and your works don't match who you are? And I'll tell you this about your secret life. It's causing unbelievable stress in your life. You think you can hold it together. You tell yourself, I can hold together my secret life and the life I want others to look into. I can hold those two together and juggle those two balls. You know what? It's not going to last. It's going to crash down one way or another. The stress you can't handle, but here's what else you can't handle. You can't handle the shame that comes with having a second life. Jesus looks to each of us, and he says, I want to rescue you from that. Look, if this is you, if, if you're terrified that, for example, your spouse is going to get a hold of your smartphone and and figure out your your passcode and and see the secret life that you've been hiding? I, I have no word of condemnation for you. I have a word of mercy for you. Run to Jesus before it all cracks up. Run in humble repentance to your Savior and forsake that double life and come back to Jesus and and be set free from this. Don't wait until it's all ruined. No, come to Jesus. His arms are open wide for you and, and he will build his integrity into your life. Now, continuing on, now verse 26. Jesus explains, he says, but you do not believe because you're not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. 
Now, there's a couple, I think, powerful things to put together here. Number one, previously in the Gospel of John, now it may not have been directly previously chronologically, but thematically in the Gospel of John, he puts them together. Previously in the Gospel of John, Jesus explained to the religious leaders that they were not valid shepherds over God's people. You're not worthy shepherds over God's people. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now keep in mind the fact that these religious leaders came to Jesus and said, okay, Jesus, tell us plainly, tell us directly, are you the Christ or not? Now, this is wonderful because Jesus basically responds by saying this. All right, well, number one, I told you through my words and my works. And number two, do you really want me to be direct with you? Do you really want to make it plain? Okay, I'll make it plain to you right now. Not only are you not worthy shepherds over God's people, you're not even worthy sheep of God. I think that was a more direct answer than they were hoping for. Jesus lays it down before them. No, you're not God's sheep. And I'll tell you why you're not God's sheep. Because you don't respond to my voice. You do not believe in me. Look at what he says there in verse 26. You do not believe because you're not my sheep. Now Jesus here just directly confronts them with the fact that they weren't even true sheep of God because the Messiah's sheep they believe the Messiah's sheep hear his voice. Now, the blessing that comes from being one of the Messiah's sheep, they don't have. You know what the blessing is of having, being one of the Messiah's sheep? There are many blessings, but Jesus is going to highlight one of them in verse 24. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Friends, that's a great promise, isn't it? Do you want eternal life? Do you want to never perish? Then come and put your trust in Jesus Christ. Let him bring you into his flock. Be one of Jesus' sheep. Now, I want you to notice there, the first thing he says along those lines, he says, I give them eternal life. Eternal life is for right now. Do you know when eternal life begins? It can begin for you right now. It's God's kind of life. That's when it can begin. Do you know when eternal life ends? Um, never. It's eternal life. And that's what Jesus is getting at. Your life is safe with me. You will never perish. Now, I want you to understand something. When Jesus said you'll never perish, he didn't mean your physical body will never perish. The physical body that I live in right now will one day perish if Jesus doesn't return first, and that's what I'm really hoping for. But it will perish. It will be buried or cremated or whatever it is that's done to it. And it'll be ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But God says this. God says, no, that life will never perish because I will even take that body and I will resurrect it some way, somehow, and that person will never perish. Now, this brings us back to a principle that I think I've been emphasizing a lot in previous months, but I don't mind emphasizing because maybe it's just me that needs to hear it, and I assume you do too. But, but maybe it's just me, so I'll just preach it to myself, and I don't mind if you over here. <laughs> Here's the principle. Life is more than the physical and the material. Do you understand that? Life is more than the physical and the material. And for some reason, I think that those of us who live in this beautiful community, this beautiful general Santa Barbara area community, that's probably a little harder for us to grab onto than others. You know why? Because physically and materially speaking, we live in an amazing place. And it's easy for it just to fill up our life, fill up our attention, fill up our senses with the physical and the material because it seems so great to us. But friends, that's a losing game. There is more to life than the physical and the material. And we need to realize that, yes, God, you want to bless us in the physical, bless us in the material. You want to meet us in the physical. You want to meet us in the material. But fundamentally, fundamentally, friends, our life is a spiritual life. And Jesus says, here's my promise to you that spiritually speaking, you have eternal life and you will never perish. Matter of fact, your life with Jesus is so secure. Look at what he says in verse 28. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My hand is upon you. And if that's not enough, Jesus says in verse 21, no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. The shepherd's hand is upon you and has a tight grip. The Creator's hand is upon you and has a tight grip. Aren't you so happy to know that God doesn't say, okay, well, it's just your responsibility to keep yourself saved. 
God says, no, my hand is upon you. My grip is upon you. And if that hand was mighty enough to create the universe, it's strong enough to hold on to you. Now, I think it's worth if you just to exhale right there, just say, yes, Lord. You're holding on to me. Now, I hope you're holding on back to the Lord, and I don't want you to ever lose your grip. But can you take some comfort in the fact that he's holding on to you? Now, if Jesus had not yet offended the religious authorities enough so far, just look at verse 30. I and my Father are one. Friends, did you see that phrase in verse 30? I and my Father are one. Now, why would Jesus say it right here? Well, because he talked about the work of Jesus holding on to his people and then the Father holding on to his people being a cooperative work, how the Father and the Son work together, how they have the same heart, how they have the same will. And Jesus amps it up a whole nother notch and he says, I and my Father are one. Matter of fact, that is a deeply profound spiritual and theological statement. It means, first of all, that the Father and the Son are distinct. In other words, the Father is not the Son and the Son is not the Father. I and my Father means that they're two separate persons. That's the truth of that. But Jesus also goes on to say, are one. And what that oneness means? Friends, that oneness is a very powerful thing. Because especially in the ancient grammar of that phrasing, it implies, and I'm not going to get the technicalities of it, I was just going to say, it's not just talking about oneness of person, but oneness of essence. What do I mean by essence? Well, friends, your essence is that you are a human being. Uh, your dog's essence is that it is a canine being, I don't know, something like that. You know, everything has its own essence. Jesus' essence, divine being, is just the same as the essence of God the Father. I and my Father are one. It's a dramatic statement. And they understood perfectly what he said. Look at it here in verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I've shown you from my Father. For which of the works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. Friends, is the movie running in your mind? Can you picture this scene? The the religious leaders, when they hear those words come out of Jesus' mouth, I and my Father are one. They go, well, let's do it. Let's stone him to death. He just committed blasphemy. He just claimed to be God. He just made a direct, unequivocal claim to be God. Now, isn't it interesting? Just previously, they said, Jesus, would you tell us plainly? And now Jesus tells them plainly, and they don't like the answer. They pick up the stones. They get ready to stone him. It shows that they understood perfectly what he said, that he claimed to be God. It also shows that they lost the argument. Friends, when you've got to resort to violence, you've lost the argument. By the way, this is one of the things that gives me great hope in this world. I look around in the world around us, and sometimes it seems crazy and that there's not a lot of hope in the world especially when you look at what's happening in the parts of the world that are under the oppression of violence from Islamic extremists. It's terrible. But let me tell you something. There's a bit of hope even in that. And here's the hope. People only resort to violence when they've lost the argument. And it shows they're on the losing side because they got to back it up with swords and guns. The fact that what we bring forth is the truth is demonstrated by the fact that we have the power of truth on our own side. It wasn't that way with the religious leaders. They had nothing in the words or works of Jesus that could show that Jesus was not the Messiah. We can't prove anything, so we're going to have to pick up rocks and throw them against you. And Jesus very calmly replies, look at it there in verse 32, many good works I've shown you from my Father. For for which of these do do you stone me? And what do they say, verse 33? No, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Friends, Jesus didn't make himself God. When he told them that he was God, he was simply telling the truth about himself. He wasn't boasting. He wasn't bragging. He was just revealing the truth. So I want you to get this scene in your mind. 
They're hostile. They've got rocks in their hands. They're ready to throw them against Jesus. It's a very tension-charged scene. And then what do we read in verse 34? Verse 34 says something like this. Jesus ran like crazy away from there. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. Does it say? No, that's the David Guzik silly version of the Bible. But what, can we just stop? Isn't it remarkable that Jesus didn't just run away? That Jesus goes, all right, let's continue on the conversation. It's a little awkward because you have rocks in your hand and you can tell they kill me. But let's talk this out. Matter of fact, Jesus is going to speak to them in a very unique way. He's going to reason with them as rabbis would reason when they would talk theology. Check it out here, starting at verse 34. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken. Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent to the world, you're blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe my works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I am in him. Therefore, again, they sought to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. Jesus very calmly, verse 34, Jesus answered them. He answered them like an educated rabbi would speak to other educated rabbis. And he draws an argument from Psalm 82. In Psalm 82, God, speaking in his word, refers to human judges as gods. He uses the phrase Elohim. Now, have you ever met people that think basically they're gods? Uh, Maybe we've had run-ins here and there with people like that. God here, in a symbolic sense, is calling these human judges gods. Why would he do that? Well, friends, is it not true that on a human level, a judge is like a god among men? In this sense, an accused stands before the judge and that man or that woman's fate is in the hand of the judge. That person may live or die depending on the word of the judge. That person may may live in jail for the rest of their life or be set free depending on the word of that judge. Friends, that is in a sense God-like power. You know what I find very interesting about it? If you go back to Psalm 82 and look at the quote there, When God called them gods, he wasn't praising them. He was calling them to responsibility. He said, listen, I said that you're like gods, but you're going to die under my judgment unless you do what's right. If anybody is in a position of authority and doesn't use it correctly in a God-honoring way, they are going to have to answer to God for that. If God has put you in a position of authority in your family, in your neighborhood, at your business, at your school, uh, in this community, whatever it is, you have a God-given responsibility to use that authority well. In in any regard, Jesus says, if God spoke of them in Psalm 82 as gods, these judges, then why are you so bent out of shape if I call myself the son of God? It's a very logical argument, especially according to the way that the rabbis would argue. And they have no adequate answer for it at all. They don't say, well, no, uh, uh." they have nothing to say in response. Now, Jesus says one other thing that I want to point out here in verse 35. In speaking about this, he throws out a phrase I think is important. He says, verse 35, and the scripture cannot be broken. Did you see that in verse 35? Friends, that's a very important principle. What Jesus is saying is that God's word will never fail. God's word can always be trusted. It is unbreakable. And through the centuries, it's been proven. If you try to oppose God and his word, you're not going to break God. You're not going to break his word. Sadly, you will be broken. God's word is like a mighty Gibraltar that the waves crash upon again and again, and the rock will never break, but the waves just dissipate back. Friends, it's very important for us to understand that God's word cannot be broken, and it can be trusted in every way. The Bible is unbreakable, and it'll break whatever opposes it. Now, at the end of it all, verse 39 Therefore, they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. I don't know how he did this. 
You know, did he just, I don't know, invisible powder? I don't know what it was. It was invisible powder. I'm just joking. But he just made his way out from their presence again. And what happens next? Friends, before we get to verse 40, I just want to paint the scene for you again. All throughout the last chapters of John, we've seen Jesus opposed by the religious leaders again and again. Opposition, opposition, opposition. The tension and the conflict has been building and building until now we come to the next several chapters of the Gospel of John. And let me tell you what's going to happen in the next several chapters. Eventually, the conflict is going to come to its peak and the religious leaders are going to engineer the crucifixion of Jesus. That's what's ahead of us. Jesus knows that his betrayal, his arrest, his beating, his crucifixion will be the greatest test that not only he has faced, but anyone has faced. The next time Jesus is in Jerusalem after this, he comes to die. So what does he do? Look at verse 40, the last couple of verses of the chapter. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. There many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true. And many believed in him there. Do you understand what Jesus did? He retreated from the field of battle. Now, please, Jesus was not a coward. Does anybody in this room think that Jesus was a coward? No. Jesus didn't retreat from Jerusalem because he was afraid of the fight. Jesus retreated from Jerusalem because he knew the greatest battle anyone will ever face is in front of me right now. I need to get away and arm before the battle. I need to go to a quiet place, not in Galilee where everybody's after me, not in Jerusalem where the religious leaders are all over me. No, I'm going to get away to an area across the Jordan River and I'm going to get myself armed before the battle. If Jesus had to do this, how much more do you and I? I think about it. Jesus knew exactly the battle that was in front of him. He knew it. Do you know what battles are in front of you this coming week, this coming month, this coming season? Now, some of you do. You go, oh, man, you should see on my calendar this, this, this thing I got going on. This, man, I know. It's right in front of me. And you may know that. Do you understand that there may be battles in front of you this week you don't have a clue about? You see, you and I, because we don't know what's right in front of us, we need to arm for the battle right now. We need to throw ourselves in surrender and submission before Jesus and say, Jesus, I need your strength. I need the filling of your spirit. I need to rely on you. I need to trust in your word. You need this. Because every person in this room, it's true, a battle is in front of you. I, I don't know if it's right in front of you or a little bit more down the way, but it's true. And God wants you to be armed and prepared for that battle. I think we do that a lot of ways. I think we do it through prayer. I think we do it through reading our Bible. I think you do it right now by you being among God's people and hearing his word and worshiping together with God's people. Whether you knew it or not, right now you're getting armed for a battle that you're going to face later on this week, maybe off a little bit more in the future. Friends, we need this. One last encouragement. Look at it here in verse 41. Then many came to him. Verse 42, many believed in him. Jesus got a lot of nonsense, a lot of opposition, a lot of, a, a, a lot of terrible things thrown at him in Jerusalem. Don't you see the goodness of his father by taking him away to this place where he could arm before the battle and just have people believe in him, just have people trust in him. He goes, yes, Lord, your work is true. Your work is good. I am ready to face what's in front of me. And what happens next? Well, John chapter 11, you can read ahead if you want, but Jesus is going to take on death itself. Now, that's a battle in front of Jesus. Father, I pray. I pray that in the personal way that only you can do it, that you would arm each one of us for the battle that we face in the coming days, weeks, months, whatever it is, Lord. 
Lord, I pray that you'd give us the awareness and the wisdom to say, I need to be strong in Jesus today because I don't know what tomorrow brings. So Jesus, we just turn aside from self-reliance. We turn aside from self-improvement. We throw ourselves upon you and the riches of your grace. And Lord, in all humility, we come before you and we say, Jesus, would you prepare me today to live for you in the coming days? We love you. We praise you. We need you to fill our life. Do it, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.